Thank you. Um, it's been very good for me to be in Trinidad. I, one of my colleagues when I started at King's College London uh, uh, in 1991, Ingrid Prasad was from, is from Trinidad, now lives in Barbados. Um, so I've heard about uh, Trinidad from various Trinidad, Trinidadians for Trinidadians for 22 years, and uh, at last I get a chance to visit. Um, I will be uh, speaking through this handout. Do most of you have copies? No? Okay. Now, the handout is divided into, uh, uh, let's say, part two, the legal, part three, the religious. And what's not on the handout is perhaps what's more important, part one, the human, the personal, uh, the social reality. Um, so I'm going to use my own um, life history as a, an example. Um, <clears throat> I was born in July 1957 at a time when there was criminalization of sexual activity, at least between men, in some cases also between women, um, in every part of the former British Empire. Well, I should say almost, with very, very few exceptions. Um, certainly in all 50 states in the U.S., in Canada, uh, uh, throughout the English-speaking Caribbean, um, uh, in the U.K., in Ireland, in, in Cyprus, uh, as well as um, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, etc. Um, so there were almost no excep exceptions in the uh, countries of, uh, of uh, uh, where the English language had some significance, where the English common law was part of the heritage. Um, so there were two signs of change in the 1950s. In 1955, uh, before I was born, the American Law Institute proposed what was known as the Model Penal Code, which proposed that um, private, consensual, adult sexual activity should not uh, be a subject for the criminal law and would be uh, legal under the new uh, penal code, which was um, eventually adopted by the state of Illinois, the first state in the U.S. to decriminalize. Um, but shortly after my birth, in September 1957, the Wolfenden Committee in England uh, proposed uh, decriminalization of sexual activity between men. Um, so, in a lecture in London once, I described myself as a Wolfenden baby. So, I was born into a world of decriminalization, but there was a sign of hope uh, shortly after my birth. Um, uh, Twelve, let's move on 12 years later, and we have Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau in Canada, who had said the state has no business in the bedrooms of the nation. And he, uh, introduced really the third decriminalization in, in the former British Empire. Illinois, 1961, was the first. England and Wales, 1967, second. And Canada, 1969, was the third. So around this time, um, I'm 12 years old. I'm starting to realize that I'm attracted to boys and not to girls. Um, I am a gay man, and, uh, but at the time, I certainly didn't accept it at all. And um, decriminalization did not mean um, that the message from my society had changed overnight. The message was still really that I should hate myself. Um, I would see the word homosexual in print, and it would send a chill down my spine. I thought, this is a fate worse than death. And my two strategies were, one, I thought that I would become a monk um, and that this would give me a good excuse for, uh, I suppose, for not having a wife. Um, and the other was that I would, I would be, do my undergraduate studies, get a job, and then I'd be able to pay for a psychiatrist. To <laughs> um, so that was, um, that's what, where I was. So from about the age of uh, 17 on, um, I was constantly in love with my male best friend, which was really torture because I couldn't say anything about it. And um, this finally came to a head when I was a first year law student at McGill University in Montreal. Um, 
I was uh, 21, going on 22 at the time. And uh, I came out to my male best friend in the first year, and he was very supportive. And he so supportive that he he uh, suggested who might be gay in our first year class. Um, and uh, I approached uh, one one class member at a dance, and that um, basically led to my introduction to the gay community in Montreal. Started going to gay bars, etc. Um, I must say it wasn't all, all a smooth transition. Um, at one point I remember going out for dinner with friends uh, from my class and the next morning trying to study contract law or next afternoon. And I just put down my head on my books and cried. And I just said, it's not fair. I just want to be like everyone else. Um, but eventually I got over that. I realized, no, I'm not like everyone else. And I've lived my way in the uh, in, lived my life in the way that's right for me. Ever since, I've been much much happier. So I, I, my, the point of my story is that this question of lesbian and gay human rights in the Caribbean is really a question of recognizing a new form of human diversity, one that um, people have not been aware of. We've known for centuries that there are men and women. Uh, once we started sailing more around the world, we discovered people of different ethnic origins, different skin colors, etc. We've known that there are different religions, but it's been assumed for centuries that there was one, one sexual orientation, heterosexual. And that's really what's been happening over the last uh, uh, 50 some years. Um, you have a minority coming out and saying, no, we are different. And, and you're treating us badly, you're discriminating against us. Um, so how, how have societies reacted to this uh, uh, form of human diversity? Well, unfortunately, traditional reaction has, has been fear. Uh, to see this minority as a threat, to, to treat um, their sexual activity as a crime, as evidence of mental illness, as a sin, um, whereas the alternative might be to uh, accept their difference and respect them as fellow human beings. Um, so um, I would say that, well, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of lesbian gay people across the English-speaking Caribbean and here in Trinidad, and they are not going away. Um, and um, they are not trying to annoy religious groups uh, in Trinidad. <laughs> that is not, not why they're different. They are just trying to be themselves. Now, at this point, I'm going to add something. Here's an exclusive. I didn't go into this in uh, Cave Hill and some uh, St. Augustine exclusive, uh, Cave Hill and Mona. But uh, you might ask the question, you're still skeptical, well, I'm sure not many of you are very skeptical at this stage, but um, okay, so they're not trying to annoy us, but why are they different? Why are they lesbian and gay? Now, in my doctoral thesis at the University of Oxford, which was eventually published as a book, uh, Sexual Orientation and Human Rights, um, uh, if you look at the concluding chapter, you'll see I compared um, several analogies that could be used to understand discrimination based on sexual orientation. One of them is the analogy with race, which I understand that uh, many people across the English-speaking Caribbean might find inappropriate. But um, let me explain why, why people make it. Um, there is some scientific evidence that an individual's sexual orientation might be, have a genetic cause. So it is in, uh, the, the feelings of sexual attraction that an individual has um, may be as um, genetically determined at birth as the color of their skin, etc. So there, there might be uh, a similarity there. Um, the problem with that is that there is no conclusive scientific evidence to date. And it's a very complex area. For example, if you take the case of identical twins, uh, you would assume a genetic cause means the same sexual orientation. Well, I have a friend in the Gay Swim Club in London 
uh, who has an identical twin brother. And I attended Christmas dinner at my friend's house. He lives with his male partner, and he invited his identical twin brother, and his female partner came, uh, came to Christmas lunch. So same genes, different sexual orientation. And the scientists would the, the struggle to explain that. Um, so in my thesis, I concluded that the uh, analogy with race wasn't necessarily helpful because of these problems of proof, but also because the controversy with sexual orientation is uh, in particular about um, chosen sexual conduct, etc. So um, making the argument, I can't help this because I'm born this way, doesn't necessarily um, uh, resolve the question. Um, so uh, unlike with, with uh, physical characteristics that are visible and understood to be genetically caused, sexual orientation is still an open question. Also, um, uh, skin color is highly visible. Uh, person's sexual orientation is invisible. So there, there's another, another difference there. So in my, um, in my uh, thesis, I decided, I concluded that a better comparison was with religion. Because a person's religion is uh, invisible and something they cannot prove. If I ask the Christians, Muslims, Hindus in the room, uh, why can't you just stop being Christian or Hindu or Muslim? Um, I want you to go to the doctor and give me proof. I want a blood test, a brain scan, an x-ray. Something will show you, show me the Hinduism physically inside you, or Christianity or Islam. And uh, of course you can't do that, and of course you shouldn't have to, because um, religion in my thesis I described as a, a fundamental choice. It's not a very personal matter that we respect in society, even though we don't necessarily understand it, we don't ask for someone to prove it, we accept their sincere affirmation, this is my religious faith. And essentially, that's what needs to be done with sexual orientation. If a person tells you that they are lesbian or gay, that they're attracted to persons of their own sex, that is a deeply personal matter that should be respected. There should be no uh, question of asking them to, to prove it. Um, so uh, that is the analogy that um, I prefer, and uh, it also uh, addresses this question of, of choice, because certainly with ad adults are fully capable of changing their religion, switching from one to the other, and we don't expect them to. So even though there is an element of choice with sexual orientation, some religions will say to a lesbian and gay person, well, that's fine, you can't help the way you are, well, uh, but our recommendation is that you remain celibate for your entire life and never uh, experience any sexual pleasure with another adult, um, which is a, quite a drastic uh, prescription. And um, <clears throat> so, um, on, the, on, uh, on, on the contrary, uh, uh, I of course argue that uh, no, you should respect the individual sexual orientation and their choice to act on it. Um, so, to conclude this part, um, I'm going to throw out an idea here, which I hope is, is going to flourish in the fertile soil of Trinidad. Um, because Trinidad, perhaps along with Guyana, is the um, most ethnically and religiously diverse part of the English-speaking Caribbean. And the uh, question I would put to um, religious opponents of um, legal reforms benefiting the lesbian and gay community uh, here in Trinidad is um, how do you tolerate each other? Um, if you're Christian, how do you live alongside Hindus and Muslims who don't believe in Jesus? Um, if you're Hindu, how do you believe, how do you live next to people who only believe in one, one God? Um, if you're Muslim, if you're living with neighbors who don't believe in the Prophet Muhammad, don't believe in the Quran. And nobody is going to Parliament and saying, I want my religion written into law. I want a law saying you can't build any of these, these Hindu temples and Muslim mosques. They're a source of temptation. They're going to lure people away. 
Okay, that's what religious freedom is all about. Coexistence. Completely opposed, uh, inconsistent religious beliefs uh, exist alongside each other. Um, so I think perhaps in the context of Trinidad, the best way to think of the lesbian gay minority is as one that is similar to a religious minority. Okay? If you don't understand them, if you think the way they're living their life is completely contrary to your own religion, well, if you're Christian, just treat the lesbians and gays the way you treat Hindus and Muslims, and vice versa, depending on which, which group you might be a part of. Okay, so, haven't heard any rousing cheers or applause yet. <laughs> I'll, I'll give, you, uh, give you some time to think about that. I was um, uh, running around the Queen's Park Savannah today in the heat. Oh my gosh, that was a challenge. Um, but uh, I did go by the uh, Nat um, Ministry of National Diversity and Social Integration. So um, I think this is something they can put on their list. Uh, how we can get uh, the sexual orientation diversity integrated into the society of uh, Trinidad and Tobago. Okay, so that was the, uh, the human, personal, social reality part that lesbian and gay people exist. They are the way they are. They're not going away. The only question really is whether um, Christian, Hindu, and Muslim heterosexual people in Trinidad are going to make their lives difficult and make them suffer, or recognize common humanity and try to change things so their lives will be better. Um, okay, that brings me to the legal part. Now, you see on page one of the handout, uh, first a snapshot of where we are in terms of criminal laws. <clears throat> in the Council of Europe, which is an international organization with 47 member states, um, uh, which has to be distinguished from the European Union with 28 member states, um, these criminal laws have been eliminated. The most recent, uh, the last one was repealed um, recently in uh, Turkish-occupied northern Cyprus. It was a, a British um, uh, law, as in the Caribbean, which um, the um, legislature of uh, the su southern Cyprus was not effectively able to repeal. Um, so it was finally done in the north. And so within the Council of Europe, I think we could say these criminal laws are a bit like the smallpox virus. Um, we have eliminated smallpox, haven't we? Uh, yeah. So uh, the idea might be kept in a lab somewhere, but hopefully uh, no one will break in and steal it. Um, and revive it. So, um, uh, if we turn to the Organization of American States, which has 35 member states, we'll see, we see that the count is 24 out of 35 of decriminalized, so two-thirds majority. The exceptions are uh, 11 of the 12 independent countries of the English-speaking Caribbean, all except for the Bahamas. Um, should all, you may, may also be aware that um, um, Britain intervened uh, with regard to British overseas territories in the Caribbean. Um, I'm sorry I don't have the exact information. I, I have a paper copy of the order in my file somewhere, but I couldn't find it. But essentially Britain extended the European Convention on Human Rights to uh, Anguilla, Bermuda, British Virgin Islands, Cayman Islands, Montserrat, Turks and Caicos. So any individual, <coughs> for example, from the Grand Cayman, a gay man could have taken a case against the United Kingdom uh, in the European Court of Human Rights. So to prevent that, um, an order from above uh, amended the criminal law, uh, except uh, in Bermuda, I believe, which had already um, done so voluntarily. Okay, so that's where the legislation is. So we. If we look at Europe, North, Central, South America, and the Caribbean as a whole, we seem to have an exception in the English-speaking Caribbean. So I suppose my purpose in highlighting this is just that I hope it would raise a doubt that if all these countries find they do not need these criminal laws, why, why do we need them here in the English-speaking Caribbean? 
They don't need them in the Spanish-speaking Caribbean, the Dutch-speaking, the French-speaking, etc. So why do we need them here? Um, okay, now, are these law, criminal laws permitted by international human rights law? Well, this question was first addressed by the European Court of Human Rights in um, 1981 in the case of Jeffrey Dudgeon versus United Kingdom. Um, what had happened in the United Kingdom was that Parliament changed the law for England and Wales in 1967 and then for Scotland in 1980. But in um, Northern Ireland, which perhaps we could call the Caribbean of um, the United Kingdom, except unfortunately <laughs> does not have the weather and beaches, but um, in any case, there was a strong uh, campaign, a lot of religious opposition to decriminalization. The slogan was, save Ulster from sodomy. Ulster being another name for Northern Ireland. Um, so the case went to the European Court of Human Rights, and the um, first question was, uh, Jeffrey Dutch was relying on his uh, Article 8 right to respect for his private life. Does his private life include his sexual life? Yes. That seemed obvious to the judges. Uh, second, um, has there been an interference with his private life? Yes. The mere existence of the legislation is a continuing interference with his private life. Essentially, the, the fear of prosecution. It doesn't matter um, that there haven't been any for a while. Uh, if a criminal law exists, it can be enforced at any time. Um, so that was the interference with his private life every single day of his life. He had to fear prosecution. And so the next question was, could the United Kingdom justify this interference as necessary in a democratic society? For, for example, for the protection of the rights of others. And on that point, there were um, two major factors that influenced the court. One was the state of European consensus on this point. So what, what were the laws in other European countries? At the time, there were only 20 Council of Europe member states. 17 had decriminalized, or 85%. It was only uh, the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, and Cyprus that still had these laws. So that made it an easy case for the court. Second factor was that uh, the law was not being enforced. So it was very difficult for the United Kingdom to argue that this law was necessary in a democratic society when it was not, not being enforced. Um, and it, in, it, so in, in, in its final uh, balancing of the interests in the case, and this is the same question for parliaments across the Caribbean and, and any courts that are able to consider the issue. Um, they compared the effect on the life of Jeffrey Dutchin with the, uh, of maintaining the criminal law with the effect of removing it on those who opposed it. And they essentially found uh, it was the balance obviously favored Jeffrey Dutchin. This is a major intrusion into his life um, whereas the opponents might be offended at the thought that men could legally engage in sexual activity, um, but that was not enough to justify the law interfering with it. Um, this is sexual activity that most, uh, well, almost certainly they would never see. So the mere knowledge that someone is doing something in your society that offends your moral principles is not enough to justify use of the criminal law to prohibit it. You have to show how they are harming harming other people. So that was the principle adopted in the Dudgeon case and subsequently applied with regard to Ireland and Cyprus. And that was the uh, beginning of a process that led to the elimination of these laws in all 47 member states. Now at the United Nations level, um, the Caribbean of Australia was the state of Tasmania, which um, have, had not uh, changed its criminal laws. So Nicholas tuned into the case to the United Nations Human Rights Committee. And the committee ruled in 1994 that there was a violation of the right to privacy in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. The reasoning is, is, is quite similar to the Dutch case, but the new, um, a new factor was considered, and that was the HIV epidemic which had not been recognized in 1981. Um, in this case, you had Tasmania arguing that they needed to maintain the law to help, um, 
to discourage um, sexual activity that might be likely to transmit HIV. And the committee rejected this argument. They referred to the opinions of public health experts that this was entirely counterproductive. That if you want to protect people's health, you make it easy for them to uh, speak openly with healthcare professionals, doctors, nurses, etc., about their private sexual activity. They should not be admitting to a criminal offense when they seek advice. So that was. Um, so that's the position at the UN level. Uh, if we turn to page two, what about the um, Inter-American Court and Commission of Human Rights? Um, to date, there is no case law, but um, there is a very strong argument that um, the criminal laws in the English-speaking Caribbean violate Article 11 of the American Convention on Human Rights in countries that are still parties to the American Convention. Uh, I understand that Trinidad has withdrawn. That, that's correct, yeah. I hope that will be reconsidered and Trinidad will rejoin at some point. But um, the reasoning of the court is, I, I would say, is fairly clear from uh, the case of Karen Atala versus Chile, in which I um, uh, served as an expert witness um, on the um, case law of the European Court of Human Rights. In that case, you had a, uh, a lesbian mother. Um, she was married to a man. Uh, they had three daughters. She realized she was lesbian. They decided to separate. They agreed that she would have custody of the three daughters. And then later she met a woman, fell in love with her, and the woman moved in with them. And this is what the husband objected to. He went to court demanded that custody be transferred to him, even though the law of Chile normally preferred the mother. Um, and he lost at the first level, lost at the second level, but won in the Supreme Court of Chile by three votes to two. Um, many people would have given up there, but Karen Atala is a trial court judge herself. And uh, she knew there was someplace else to go outside of Chile, the uh, Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, and then the court. She took her case there, and she won, finally, the judgment of February 2012, with very strong reasoning, which to me makes it absolutely clear that um, the convention also prohibits these criminal laws. This argument is now being tested in a case against Jamaica, pending before the court, uh, for the commission. Now, my understanding is that Jamaica does not accept the jurisdiction of the court, so the case could not go beyond the commission. However, uh, Barbados does accept the um, jurisdiction of the court. So theoretically, there could be uh, X versus Barbados case that would go to the commission and possibly to the court. Right, so in international human rights law, the position is clear. Um, these laws are a violation of the, the right to privacy. Um, there, are also the, there are also many decisions at the national level. I've provided some of them here. Um, there are many from U.S. state supreme courts, uh, the Ontario Court of Appeal, Quebec Court of Appeal in Canada, and of course the most important, Lawrence and Garner versus Texas for the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, there were criminal laws in along the Gulf of Mexico from Florida to Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas until 2003 when they were all struck down by the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, at this point, you might say, well, this is all very interesting, but this is all very northern. Um, and uh, what about the Global South? Well, courts across the Global South have reached similar conclusions, uh, starting with the Constitutional Court in Ecuador, the Constitutional Court of South Africa, courts in Fiji, Hong Kong, Nepal, and the Delhi High Court. Now, the one big exception to this trend is was on the 11th of December 2013 when the Supreme Court of India, only two judges, overruled the two judges of the Delhi High Court and said that the criminal law in India is constitutional. Now, all I can say is that, there's, that this judgment has generated a lot of criticism in India. It's really an embarrassment to the court because the court traditionally, so the Supreme Court has traditionally looked to legal developments in other countries in interpreting the Indian Constitution. In this case, they basically uh, closed their eyes. 
they said, we don't want to know about anything happening in the rest of the world. And so there are applications to have the decision reviewed by five judges, and uh, I would hope that the Supreme Court will uh, um, agree with the Delhi High Court and find the law unconstitutional. That will <coughs> be an extremely important decision for the Commonwealth um, when it um, finally comes out. Um, so I suppose that just sum it up, I would say the two judges in the Supreme Court are just wrong because their judgment is, is very badly reasoned um, and they might be overruled. So, um, right, now the, um, at this point I just want to add something because um, I prepared a lecture um, for the three law schools of the uh, University of the West Indies um, focusing on criminalization, but I understand in uh, Trinidad and Tobago there's a um, discussion about um, anti-discrimination protection, uh, forbidding discrimination based on sexual orientation, which could be through constitutional reform, could be through new legislation, etc. So I thought I should comment on that. Um, that hasn't historically been the most common pattern, but there are examples starting with, in the 1980s, the state of Wisconsin, the state of New South Wales and Australia. There are some current examples in Southern Africa, including Mauritius. I was just told today that St. Lucia is in this position. And so if um, in the political circumstances of Trinidad that, that makes more sense, um, there, there's nothing um, Nothing, uh, nothing wrong. There was nothing wrong in politics. It's all about whatever works. But um, nothing wrong with having an anti-discrimination law first. Um, what the benefit of an anti-discrimination law is, it, send, it, it sends a stronger message, which is essentially that lesbian and gay people are equal citizens of Trinidad. Um, now, on the one, that's a stronger message, but it's also one that many people feel more comfortable discussing because they don't have to talk, essentially they're talking about people and not private sexual behavior. So if that, if that helps people in the debate and it helps achieve legal protection, um, I, I think it's a great idea. Um, it does mean that temporarily you have contradictory messages from the law. One says you're an equal citizen, another says in theory you could be prosecuted. Um, what has happened in most places is that contradiction is resolved with decriminalization later on. But um, in fact, this uh, uh, perhaps Trinidad could follow the path of South Africa, where the first debate was about the new constitution and sexual orientation was included in the equality clause. Um, decriminalization actually only came five years later when that equality clause was applied the criminal law by the Constitutional Court. Um, so, um, although the legal <coughs> constitution is different in, in, in Trinidad, um, uh, that the same sequence could possibly occur here. Okay, let's turn to part three, page three, um, the question of um, the effect on religious freedom. Now, I will return to decriminalization here, but you could modify most of what I say and apply it to an anti-discrimination law as well. Um, well, I suppose it flows from what I said earlier about religious diversity. In Trinidad, Christians, Hindus, uh, I assume there's a small Jewish community, Muslim Sikhs, um, coexist. Do not ask um, the, the state to enforce their individual uh, religious rules. Um, through the criminal law or any other kind of legislation. So um, if, if religious freedom uh, survives in that situation, why would it be any different um, if there were decriminalization in Trinidad? Um, and here I would stress that I think it's important in diverse multicultural societies to have a, a strict separation of law and religion. The law has to apply to everyone and be accepted by everyone, regardless of their religion and whether they have a religion or not. So you can never base the justification for a law on a religious text, because many people won't subscribe, won't believe in that religious text. Um, 
So, um, so law and religion need to be um, kept separate. Religious rules are personal rules that an individual believes in very strongly and applies to their own life, but should not ask the state to impose on others through the vehicle of, of the criminal law. And um, I was pleased to come across a statement by Gandhi on this uh, when he was talking about his dream of a secular Republic of India, that um, individuals would deal with their own religion as a personal matter, but would not ask the state to enforce it. Um, right, so I, I wrote uh, an article for an Indian law journal, um, and uh, I've included an extract from it, starts at the middle of page three. It's about the roots of section 377 of the Indian Penal Code. I said it was Christian religious law converted to English criminal law exported to India and the Caribbean. Um, now, if we look at the most commonly cited prohibition from Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, if a man also lie with mankind, as he lies with a woman, both of them committed an abomination, they shall surely be put to death. Now, I think if anyone relies on this part of the Old Testament and says, well, it's clearly stated here, this is wrong, um, and therefore this should be reflected in the criminal law of Trinidad, they are reading the Old Testament very selectively because they would find other parts of the Old Testament they would not agree with, they would not want to see in the criminal law of Trinidad. So I've listed a few examples here, but the one that uh, springed, uh, that struck me as possibly most relevant, relevant is committing adultery. <laughs> so there is uh, a clear statement in Leviticus that those who commit adultery shall be put to death. Um, but I would assume that on the criminal law of Trinidad, adultery is not an offense. No. Uh, safe assumption. Safe assumption, yeah. Okay. So, so, so Christians, uh, let's say Christians and Jews who would like to see adultery be a criminal offense, manage to survive without it. Um, Hindus and Muslims might, some, some might want the same offense. But so, and similarly, we have a very strong prohibition of blasphemy. Um, which fortunately I don't think is uh, in the criminal. Is there a pro-crime of blasphemy in Trinidad? No, not sure. Yeah, there was a, a common law crime in England and Wales which was repealed in, in 2008, but this is an ongoing issue in Pakistan in particular, um, where there is a crime of blasphemy with a penalty of death, and it's actually Christians who are frequently accused of insulting the Prophet Muhammad find themselves in jail, basically on death row, uh, facing the possibility of execution. So um, typically, uh, I must say, religious majorities uh, often do not necessarily believe in religious freedom. Um, because when you're a majority, you have the power through the legislature to impose what you want. They tend to believe in religious freedom when they're in the minority. Okay, but I think um, this is a case of the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have done unto you. So I suppose I would say treat the lesbians in the case of Trinidad as you would like to see the Christians of Pakistan treated. Okay. Um, right, so... Um, at the bottom, I have my own personal explanation of how this um, um, this, re this prohibition of men lying with mankind uh, might have come into being. I'm uh, not a theologian. A student at, at Mona said that I was dissing the Bible here, <laughs> so uh, I hope no one will take offense. But um, if 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 um, that society reacted negatively to seeing two man, men engaging in sexual activity. Perhaps it was because men were considered superior to women, and the man who was being penetrated was acting like a woman. Basically, he was a traitor, forfeiting his superior status. It's interesting that we don't usually see uh, prohibitions of women lying with women, 
Um, I would say because women were already inferior, <laughs> things couldn't get any worse. So. <laughs> um, and perhaps also the idea there was concern about population. You were competing with other tribes. You needed soldiers for the army, etc. So. Um, Sexual activity without appropriate potential may have seemed a threat then. Okay, but if we fast forward to the 21st century, men and women are equal. We do not have a problem with um, overpopulation. Perhaps this rule can be left to religion and does not be, need to be written into the criminal law. Okay, um, my final point is about um, what I would uh, what I would call scaremongering. I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, uh, I don't think the religious people in Trinidad have anything to worry about. Uh, what's being proposed is either decriminalization first or an anti-discrimination law, and then we'll see later about decriminalization. But um, lawyers or activists are coming from uh, Britain and the US and, and warning you about the terrible things that await you if you make any changes to the law. And I really think this is inaccurate and exaggerated. Um, the main allegation or claim seems to be that if you decriminalize, you might as well start same-sex marriage because the two are essentially the same, one follows uh, like uh, morning follows night, um, etc. It, it, it follows very quickly and therefore you've got to dig in and say no to decriminalization. And I think that is just false as a factual matter if you look at the countries, uh, in uh, examples of different countries and how long it took them to move from decriminalization to marriage. England and Wales, uh, 46 years. Canada, uh, 36. Massachusetts, uh, roughly 40 years. Um, so I really don't think there's anything to worry about. Uh, Trinidad is not going to be rushed in to any of its decisions about family law. You can change, you can take it one step at a time at your own pace, change the criminal law, uh, or ch have an anti discrimination law. And there will be no need to discuss um, changes to family law for a very long time. Um, I, this, the period after a decriminalization or an anti-discrimination law or both, I would call the getting to know each other period. When these legal reforms make it easier for lesbian and gay people in Trinidad to be open, and that may lead to changes in attitudes and permit discussion of other reforms, or it might not. If we look at the Bahamas with decriminalization in 1991, 22 years later, have you heard any discussion of same-sex marriage about to happen in the Bahamas? Don't think so. So, so definitely uh, Trinidad is, cannot be stampeded into any, any reforms it doesn't want. Um, the, uh, the other concern is that one of the changes that will inevitably follow is a prohibition of incitement to hatred based on sexual orientation. Um, and that this will limit the uh, free speech of uh, Christians, Hindus, Muslims, etc., who are opposed to same-sex sexual activity. Um, well, first of all, you don't necessarily have to pass these, uh, what are known as hate speech laws. In the U.S., they're considered unconstitutional, contrary to the First Amendment. Uh, in Europe, they are permitted by the European Convention. Canada, the Supreme Court, when the first time they considered the issue, was divided five to four. Five judges took the European position for the U.S. position. So we do have them in Canada. But um, when they're drafted, the um, members of Parliament do consider questions of, of freedom of expression. So if you look at the wording of the Public Order Act 1986 in England and Wales as amended in 2008, it permits uh, criticism of sexual conduct or practices and the urging of persons to refrain from or modify them. So that's a pretty, uh, pretty generous exception. I don't uh, 
I don't think there is much to worry about. The case of Harry Hammond that's widely cited was not under this hate speech provision. It was on a, another section dealing with insulting language. And I believe, actually, the result of this prosecution was, was the ultimate repeal of the language about it. Uh, the part about ins uh, insulting words. Um, and similarly in Canada, you see an exception for uh, expressing an opinion on a religious subject or an opinion based on a belief in a religious text. Certainly in, in uh, Europe, there have been two prosecutions, one of a Muslim imam in the Netherlands, one of a Christian pastor in Sweden, and in both cases, the courts, uh, the appellate courts acquitted them. Uh, based on freedom of religion. So I don't think there is really, uh, I think these concerns are uh, exaggerated. Um, right, I think to, to state a closing wish, I, I hope that the, the debate in Trinidad will continue and um, that it will lead within a few years to either decriminalization or anti-discrimination provision in constitution or statute. Thank you.